farm has been described uh, in the media as Britain's Pompeii. I'm not quite sure if that's a, a good description, but Mark will, Mark Knight, I hope will illuminate us. Mark's a senior project officer at the Cambridge Archaeological Unit, where he's worked for 25 years. His research is centered on the Neolithic and Bronze Age archaeology of the Lower Neem Valley and its relationship to the Fenland Basin's deep sediment sequence. Key excavations have involved the sites of Bradley Fen and Muss Farm, both situated on the southeastern margins of the Flag Fen Basin. So, with no more ado, over to Mark. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to come and speak. Um, before I actually start my talk proper, I thought I'd just pay a quick tribute to Adrian Challand, um, who sadly passed away at the end of last year, who, for me, um, is sort of connected to my, my whole sort of knowledge of the Lower Neen Valley and the archaeology of Peterborough. And I've spent many a good time with him on site, um, having a good laugh, but also just, just learning from his sort of deep experience about the potential of this landscape. And um, so that I just wanted to say that before I began. So the title of my talk is Out of the River. Um, and it's, it's this idea really of, of, a, of a settlement that was built over a, a watercourse um, and, and the, the exceptional preservation um, that was created for our understanding of, of later Bronze Age settlement. So it's a story of a small defended hamlet built on a shallow river, which itself was situated within a peat pen landscape, also characterized by shallow stagnant water. And in its simplest expression, the Muss Farm Power Dwelling Settlement comprised a group of closely spaced timber roundhouses tightly encircled by an impressive palisade. Shortly after the settlement had been created, a small rectangular building was added to the current plan, and its introduction happened not long before the settlement was raised by a catastrophic fire. And that's it really, isn't it? That's the, the thing that what makes Musk Farm sort of exceptional is those special preservation circumstances, the short duration of the settlement, the fact that it was burnt down, but also that the burning debris of the settlement was extinguished and then preserved within the water environment of the, of the underlying stream. And it provides us with an abundance of detail and a profusion of things or stuff. And I suppose if the site is known as the sort of Pompeii of the Fens, in a way my lecture is, or my presentation is about trying to, to think about that connotation and, and about what it is that we've actually found. And I think most importantly for me is, and I'm a sort of in spite of its exceptional preservation, is the fact that we feel that we've found the routine, the everyday, both in terms of its architecture and also the fact that it was provisioned for the most part with routine and everyday things. And that contrary to the impression given by a more familiar, much less well-preserved later Bronze Age settlement site, the sort of standard orthodox site we find a few posters and a pot shirt and a piece of animal bone, the story we get from Must Farm is one is a world full of clutter. And I think if I do nothing else in this presentation is to get to the end of it with the idea of giving that impression really, just how much stuff there was in circulation at any one time and what that says about what's normally represented within the archaeological record, and how it might make, 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 make us think differently about sort of later Bronze Age settlement and all the materials within. And I suppose to give it the sort of, the full sort of Pompeii effect, is, is that, that idea really is that the potential that we find a full range proportion of objects which are in circulation at any one time in the past systemic or living context. And I suppose that's my presentation really did, yeah. Did we? And, it, and is that the case? And therefore, where can we go with it? As with Su Susan Greeney's presentation, I'll give you a little sense of where we are in time and where we are in space. And I'll begin with a timeline uh, very similar to what Susan presented. And on here, you can see, I'll just highlight it, sort of late Neolithic, early Bronze Age transition period that she was focusing on. And for my presentation, we're going to move into the, the Bronze Age proper. 
and to the towards the end of the Bronze Age, what's the period known as a sort of subdivision of the Bronze Age into the Late Bronze Age. And we can characterize that that block of time by a series of sort of prominent features. So as Susan mentioned at the beginning of the early Bronze Age, it's a landscape that's basically made up of lots and lots of monuments, and mostly these are Rome barrows and full of full of the dead, basically. And by the end of the Bronze Age, we, we, we almost get to the sort of the flip side of that. It seems to be mostly made of settlement, and it's brought a lot of Bronze Age commentators to suggest that at the beginning we have all of the dead but none of the living, and at the end of the Bronze Age we have the living but none of the dead, the sort of burial record disappears. And sitting in the middle of that sort of progression, it's the, the, the sort of inception of field systems, the sort of Fengate world of, of ditches and banks and the, the land division separating the landscape. So Must Farm sits at the end of the Bronze Age, what we might call the Terminal Bronze Age. So it's only a, a matter of decades before the beginning of the Iron Age. So that's it situated in time. And this is it situated in space. So this is a, a LiDAR map of England and it also shows the sort of deep sediment covers of landscapes like the Fenland Basin, the Humber Estuary and Dartmoor. And if we go in closer we can see the Fenland Basin as a LiDAR image. Um, we can see the, the surrounding highland, so Peterborough here, Cambridge here, Kings Lynn up here and then this is the Wash and you can see that the Peat Fen or the Cambridgeshire Fens is the same colour as the North Sea because it sits at sea level. And then here we can see the island of Whittlesea with its characteristic sort of fishtail shape. And those big blue blobs you can see there are the rip pits of Whittlesea, which is the context of the Musk Farm investigation. So going closer again, this is a, a LiDAR image of Whittlesea. So there's the, the tail of the, the island. Here's Fengate and Stangrown. And this is the Musk Farm quarry, which is where we, the site was first found. But more importantly on this image, you can see one of the rodents making its way in through the modern agricultural landscape. And you can see a dark channel cutting through the top, which is the freshwater channel of Musk Farm. And that's where Musk Farm is located. And then because of all the work that we've done in that area, we've actually been able to sort of see beneath the surface as well and take away the sediment and actually look at the paleotopography, which basically exaggerates the sort of Fennon Islands of Whittlesea Eye and Thorny and really sort of shows where the Flag Fen Basin lies, but also it shows that our freshwater channel sits within a much deeper trench that takes the lower mean and its sort of Mesolithic and Neolithic forms as well. And that's where Musk Farm sits within that context. So we're able to get that sort of beneath the surface understanding and put our site into its proper context because of the circumstances of, of the investigation, which is the, the Musholm Quarry, the, the giant brick pit that's interested in deposits much deeper than, than Bronze Age or Neolithic or Mesolithic sediments. And we're able to expose that sort of incremental development of, of Fenland, the lower peak, the Fen clay and the upper peak. So on this image, we can see Fengate Power Station in the background, but more importantly, we can see the sort of Holocene sediment sequence, and we can see the big dark smile of the, the freshwater channel, which is the context of the Musk Farm Power Drilling Settlement. And this is it in close up. And it, it basically it tells everything really about our investigations and the fact that it is intact, it's, it's three dimensional, it's not truncated. It has a, a a long history, it's a chronology of 1600 BC at the bottom and 100 BC at the top. And it's a sluggish, slowly silting up channel, basically preserving anything within its, within its sediment. And at the base of the channel, we found numerous hurdle fish weirs, 24 eel traps or fish tracks, all dating to those early parts of that channel history, together with a series of, of log boats dating to the Middle Bronze Age right through to the Middle Iron Age, and sitting in that sort of lower profile of those, of those channel silts. And I put this slide up also not just because it shows the log boat, but because it shows the channel in the background and, and to give you a sort of sense of its scale um, and the, the context of, of our site. So 
the, the channel itself goes through the uh, Musk Farm pit and through where the modern quarry is today. And this part here is the section with the, the fish weirs and the fish traps and the log boats. And then if we go downstream from there, about 300 metres, you can see the site of the Musk Farm pile dwelling. So it sits in the same profile, but it's truncated along its northern edge by the old pit. Um, and, and that's basically how the site was found with the exposure of timbers sticking out of the, the old quarry pit. And as you can see, rather than sitting at the base of the channel, the horizon that we're interested in sort of sits in the middle. It's the sort of jam in the sandwich, and this is the horizon of, of the settlement, which in excavation looked like that. So the same silts that engulf the fish weirs and the log boats also engulfed our, our settlement and, and created this excellent preservation. And you can see our methodology of sort of dangling off the scaffold frames and slowly removing the, the river silts to expose the architecture. So in 2015, we excavated the site in, in its entirety. Um, we put a big warehouse over the top, which measured 25 meters by 45 meters. So that gives you a sense of the scale. And this side here is the, the Southern River Bank. This is the, the river itself. The Northern River Bank was removed by the old quarry pit. And we can see a continuous palisade around the settlement and then with a series of collapsed structures sitting in within the channel so, so it's itself. So we end up with this plan. So in effect, the rectangle you can see is the, the size of our excavation and the mass of wood is the remains of the settlement. And there are sort of, I suppose, two kinds of preservation going on here. One is through water logging. So the majority of the uprights are there because they're in that sort of oxygen free sort of closed environment of the river sediment. And then there are all the collapsed horizontals, which are there because they are charred because they were part of the complication of the settlement and also they are waterlogged. So this is what we were presented with within our excavation. Um, and you can see there's a sort of a sense of, of roof fans and of walkways and floors and the palisade around the outside of the, the settlement itself. So I want to present the settlement in, a, in, a, in, its, in its own history, I suppose, the sort of key episodes of that, which is its construction, its occupation and its abandonment. Um, and as you'll see through my presentation, that these things pretty much happened hard on the hills of each other. There's, there's very little time overall in, in this succession. Um, I want to, first of all, build the settlement, and then I want to occupy it, and then I want to show you it on its abandonment, and, and for us to think about the, the sort of relationship between the occupation and the construction, but also the implications of a, an abandonment that was unplanned through the, the nature of the complication. So to start with, we'll look at the architecture, the, the build of the settlement and, and, and its individual structures. So back to our, our plan of the wood mats. And you can, you can imagine our task in, in terms of trying to understand this, this great uh, agglomeration of materials. But the, the nice thing is, is that if we take away the horizontals and just go down to the uprights, you can actually already see the sort of the, the nature or the plan of the settlement, including the palisade and the, the individual roundhouses and, and the rectangular structure within, within the footprint of the, of, the, of the settlement plan. And we were able to identify quite quickly um, individual structures, but also the fact that the, the roundhouses or the stilted buildings were made, the, the, the uprights were majority with were oak. And these are some of these large oak piles. You can see that's pulling one out, but in a way it sort of stands for it being inserted in deep into the, into the river segment. Whereas the palisade was made up mostly of ash uprights, but with occasional oak uprights in there. Um, and again, this gives you a sense of not just the, the scale of the endeavor and the, the, the amount of material, but also a slight sense of selection and also the sense of how good the preservation was at the site. And that was, I suppose, exemplified by the fact that not only did we find the uprights, but we also found the wood chips from the construction of the settlement. So on this image here, you can see the pale ash wood chips from the making of the palisade, but also if you look closer, you'll see there's lots of darker wood chips from the oak uprights of the, of the individual structures. So if we plot just the oak piles, the settlement plan looks like this, and you can still see individual buildings, 
and you can make out the outline of the palisade. And then if we add the ash, you see that the, the palisade basically is a sort of standalone structure, different in its sort of makeup to the, to the main buildings. But also importantly, what this image demonstrates, I think, is, is the selection of, of materials, but also the sense of the sort of coherent plan. It's the idea that it's is built as one, pretty much, um, with an idea of how it's going to sit within the river itself. And it does sit in the river. It's not on the banks. It's very much aligned on the course of the, of the, the stream itself. So if we focus on structure one, the, the sort of best preserved of all the, the, the roundhouses, within the settlement. We can go to an image that we've perhaps all seen before, which is the, the collapsed structure. You can see, um, if I highlight this, you get a sense of the, the ash palisade going along the outside, the associated walkway, the 10 oak piles of the outer ring and the six oak piles of the inner ring. And then we can see also the the sort of spokes in the wheel, the raft, and so the roof collapsed down on top. Mm. In the background, we can see a, a walkway um, surviving as well. And the important thing about this is that, as well as this idea of the sort of the coherent nature of the settlement, is that when Ian Tyers looked at the tree ring data, the, the, the sort of dendrochronology in trying to date the settlement, he was unable to do it because of the the, the, the trees didn't have enough rings and they were outside of the, the known sort of dating within the within the locality but what he was able to say was that the all the wood used in the palisade and the structures was failed in the same year um, so this is what he called his year zero he was also able to say that or at least he believes that the structures were burnt down when the wood was still green or, or hadn't been fully seasoned so to his knowledge that would suggest the settlement was basically burnt down within a within a year of its construction so what that means is that our settlement was built as one and was destroyed as one, and that we end up with a, a basically a very short duration for its, for its occupation. And I think this all adds to the sense of the, the strong patterning that we're able to observe. Um, we were able to take um, some of the, the, the uprights with the, the known um, growth rings and actually do some wiggle match dating on them. And, and um, Peter Marshall from Historic England has been able to come back with a, a construction date for settlement of about 850 BC, give or take 10 years either side. So we're looking at the middle of the 9th century BC, so as I said before, at the very end of the, the late Bronze Age. So this is, this is what we were confronted with. So you can see here the roof rafters um, being very prominent, but also you can see that they're slightly mounted because there's a sense that the, the rest of the building is underneath the collapsed roof. So in our understanding of the fact that large parts of the architecture were still present within the river sediments, we basically come up with a reconstruction, something like this. And you can see it's quite simple. In a sense, it's a series of piles with ring beams around the top and roof rafters, um, and that there are floor joists and there are these intriguing sort of flying joists or sprung poles underneath helping to support the floors above the watercourse. Um, and that the large part of the superstructure as a result of the conflagration basically fell into the, into the river and was extinguished and then was covered by the, by the silts. But what we also know is that not everything of the superstructure actually made it into the burial record. So the upper portions of the piles, for example, we didn't find those. And there's a chance that there are other elements that were still attached to those that basically rotted away in the air and, and never entered into the, into to what we excavated. So a sense of for all of its completeness, there's still some sense of, of partiality as well. So the excavation of, of, the, of Roundhouse One looked like this once we'd taken away the roof from sort of three quarters of its, of its ground plan. And I think the more we sort of think about our, our project is this sort of sense that there are certain elements of it, the sort of robuster elements that are very prominent um, so things like the roof rafters and the piles, and they they give us a very sort of strong impression of of the architecture and what was there. But we need to remember that there are sort of subtler elements that that are just as well preserved, but because they are less less robust and smaller diameter and things, um, they don't get the same sort of focus. So I don't know if you can see on this image, but you can actually see elements of the floors as well as elements of of the roof. 
So if we look at the sort of diameters of the, the timbers used in, in its construction, we can see that the piles and the mortise beams and the rafters are quite large diameter and that, therefore as a result of the complication, they, they can be charred rather than burnt away. Whereas the materials that made up the floors and walls are much smaller in diameter and, and often they would have just turned into ash. But even so, their presence is, is definitely there and there's enough there for us to reconstruct all the different elements of the, the original buildings. So you can see here, this is a plan of the, the sort of surviving charred wattle or hurdle panels that made up the floors and the walls. So although maybe not as sort of vibrant in, 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 in the way that they show themselves, they're, they're, they are there nevertheless. And again, in this image, you can see that sort of contrast between the roof rafters and the, the floors on the right hand side of the image. You can see the, what survives the floors through here. And if I go in close, see again, and again, just fragments of, of the, the hurdle floors. Um, our understanding of the walls of the buildings were also given to us, not necessarily by the, the surviving fragments themselves, but also by sort of circumstantial evidence. So these are the undersides of the, the tie beams or mortise beams that went around the top of the piles. And you can see that we have a series of protection marks. And these were common for most of the, the ring beams. And our understanding of these is that this is the point where the sails of the, the hurdle walls or wattle walls had contact with the underside of the ring beams and therefore they were protected and uncharred. So you can see that we've got a, a very sort of clear understanding now of the, the, the nature of the architecture. And similarly, those sprung floor joists that I showed you in our reconstruction were beneath water, they survive um, as well as the actual piles. And you can see a whole series of them here forming a sort of nest between beneath the center of the building. And you can see them driven deep in the angles um, underneath structure one here. So in reconstructing um, Roundhouse One, um, I've made this, this little model really, and we sort of did this as a sort of help of trying to understand and actually write the, the, the site up or the building up. So here you can see, um, this is the, the river bank along here. This is the line of the oak piles marking out the palisade. And here's the outer and inner ring of, of structure one. And if we add the, the mortise beams around the top, you can see that we end up with basically a, a double ring construction, which is very similar to what a lot of sort of terrestrial examples of roundhouses are, are reconstructed like. And then I've added the ash of the palisade to give a sense of that sort of selection of, of timbers. And then you can see those sprung joists. Um, this is a, a potential sort of possibility of how they worked supporting the floors. And then you can see the, the, the hurdle floors going into the buildings. And then the a walkway associated with the palisade and the relationship between the building and the palisade itself. And then the rafters of the roof in a sense of a sort of clay capping around the sort of the center of the buildings and then thatch and turf forming the main roofing materials. We found lots of clay and turf and thatch within the, the sort of charred debris within the river sediment around structure one. And in plan it looks like this. You can see how it starts to look like what we found within the sort of conflated mass of wood. And just some images of, of this, this, this model. And again, if we look underneath it, you can see basically what was surviving in the, in the waterlogged context. So here's those sprung joists supporting the floors underneath. So in many ways, we might have excavated a pile dwelling um, within a Southern English or Fenland context, but in many ways, we were digging a standard, bog standard roundhouse. And it's interesting in a way that this is a, a stilted version of what is so sort of ubiquitous within later Bronze Age settlement context. So the top image here is of a standard double ring or old roundhouse, and this idea of the centre and periphery, and that the, the main ring is there to support the roof and the outer ring is there to support the wall. And the most farm concentric post ring roundhouse has, has the sort of similarities even down to its diameter. But also you can see that, that because they're building above water, there's, there's a much more robust construction and the outer ring not only supports the walls, but also supports the roof. Now, 
I think most most of us have dug sort of landscapes where we've excavated roundhouses, which all we get is the, the remnant post holes, and if we're lucky, a few potsherds and things, but there's very little else survives. And as a consequence, most of our understanding of sort of roundhouse architecture is based upon those two dimensional plans. And there's been lots of sort of models built around them about these ideas of center and periphery and the ideas of people living around halves, and also gone into the whole sort of cosmology of, of the architecture, the idea of the orientation of the doorways, the rising of the sun and the sun moving around the house and this idea of living and working spaces and sleeping spaces and things. And it's come to sort of dominate the, our understanding about how these spaces were used and what was going on inside of them. And I suppose we're in that fortunate position that we're not looking at a two dimensional building, but we're looking at it in its three dimensions and we get to see the, the real nature of the architectural space. And as you will see shortly, we also get to understand about how that space was utilised. And to, to go inside the building, so this, this here is on the, on the, the left of the image is the Mushop Farm Structure One with its double ring construction. And the right hand side is a building found at King's Dyke, which is up on Whittlesea Island. So it's you know, a kilometre away. It dates to the early Iron Age. Um, and if we look at the internal space of the two buildings, you can see that they are they are like for like. So in a way, there's a sort of cliche here that it's just the mass farm structure is another roundhouse in the sort of larger corpus of, of dwellings that occurred from the Middle Bronze Age through to the to the light, later Iron Age. Um, the nice thing for us is that the building on the right, the the King's Dyke building, is is something that we we occupied as as a sort of I don't know as, as a joke in a way, but we sort of we put. We put furniture inside of it. We 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 try to give us sort of an idea of what the space was like by inhabiting it with with modern material culture. It's almost as if, for the lack of actually finding materials within it, we we occupied it ourselves to give us a sense of how that space worked and things. So we're now in the fortunate position with the the Mus Farm buildings to actually to actually look at a, a site that is well preserved that does still hold its sort of household goods, its its provisions. So that's where I'm going to go now within our sort of succession is the occupation and look at the sort of material culture and plant and animal remains. I don't have time now to present everything. Um, I'm going to give you a sort of selection of some of the materials preserved, but the things that try and use materials that are, I don't know, give a sense of how space was used, but also say something about the sort of temporality or duration of settlement as well. So back to structure one and taking off the roof and going inside the building. Um, you can see as well as the remnants of architecture and the collapsed clay and, and sort of patches of turf from the roof and things, there's also material culture. So you can see here there's a pot, there's a wooden bucket, there's a wooden trough just here, there's an element of some sort of internal partition. Thing. So, and all of this sat within a very shallow deposit but also contained all of the collapsed um, remains of the settlement. So the rafters and the floor joists and the, the walls and things share the same context as, as the materials that I'm about to describe. So that thin horizon. So this is the riverbed here, and this is the river returning to being basically a slow, stagnant silt filled channel. And this horizon here represents the, the duration, but also the inventory of the settlement. Now, just like the architecture, there was strong patterning with the material culture. So, for example, within the footprints of individual buildings, we found lots of whole vessels and whole wooden um, containers. Whereas around the, the sort of um, circumferences of the structures, we found what we called the sort of proto or formative middens, where we found lots of broken material culture, so potsherds and butchered animal bones and burnt stones and things. So that patterning was, was consistent with inside the palace. So to give you an example of how that worked, this is a, a close-up of one of those middens and we've got lots of butchered animal bones. We've got the antler of a um, skull fragment of a butchered red deer, but there are also things like wild boar and pig um, in the same context. And then inside the buildings, we were finding articulated remains of, of young three to six month year old lambs, which we believe were alive at the point of the complication. So these are the, the sort of the, the victims of, of the burning down of the settlement. Um, 
to, to, to add to that understanding, really, is that not only did we find their articulated remains, but also we found um, charred land droppings in, in, the, in the same parts of the structures. Um, we took all of the, the animal bone from the settlement, and it's a bit like trying to reconstruct the architecture. We, we took the animal bone and laid it out as it was found within the, the settlement grid, um, marked it all up, and then spent a week basically refitting the, the bone back into its constituent parts and things. Um, and we're able to start to see sort of joints of meat and, and components of wild boar and red deer and, and, um, and pigs. Um, and actually see them as sort of the, 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 the remnants of males within individual structures. And Vida's work on that was, was able to show that, that not all of the animals were being represented. So this is a, a sort of diagram of, of the, the pigs that were found within the settlement. And you can see that there are certain components that were very prominent, but also certain components that were that were missing. Um, and also she was able to show that that only certain parts of the sort of foot reactions were actually happening within the, the context of the settlement. And, and it's her understanding that the slaughter, skinning, and, and, and basically apportioning of the different elements of the, of the animals was happening off site, probably up on Whittlesea Island or Fengate or somewhere like that. And that only certain parts of the animals were arriving actually up to the settlement itself. And one of the clearest ways of demonstrating that was that there's a particular butchery practice that goes on in the, the late Bronze Age within, within the, the locality, which is the splitting of animals down through the, through the spine, down through the vertebrae. So you end up with the, the vertebrae being, being cut in half, so you have the left side and the right side. We had lots of these for well, most of the animals across the, across the site. Um, and one of the, the sort of main tasks of the refitting exercise was to, was basically to take one of these split vertebrae and see if we could get a left and a right side to refit, and it never happened. So there's a sense here that only parts of animals are coming to the settlement, so maybe the left side of a wild boar comes to our side, and the right side goes to another side. So just like with the animal bone, the, the, the pottery had a, a similar sort of fragmentation pattern. So the middens were full of broken pots and shirts and things, the sort of things that you find at the bottom of a standard terrestrial pit site and things. Whereas the footprints, the buildings were full of complete vessels, so equivalent to the articulated lands. So we had everything from tiny little finger bowls, cups, small courseware bowls, fineware bowls, and then right up to these very large storage jars. And in one case, as you can see here, we had a nested set of a large storage jar with a medium size one inside that, and inside that was a small one. And it looks as if these vessels were brand new and have never been used. So just like with the animal bone, we have that ability to take potsherds and refit them back to their original form and actually start to look at the fragmentation patterns, the relationship between the middens and the individual structures, but also to think about the, the, the scale of the assemblage, how many pots were present, what was the range, the proportion of different vessels within individual structures, and actually start at building ceramic inventories individual buildings themselves. So we spent two weeks basically sticking all the pots back together again. Um, you can see that the great thing was is that the majority of each vessel was present and often you'd be building one and you find sherds that look the same but it belonged to a, a, a sort of a partner vessel that was the same shape and size. And so there's a real sense here of the sort of coherent nature of the assembly. So this is a, an image of piles of potsherds, and this is what it looks like when we start putting them all back together again. So we had 2,188 sherds, and we ended up reconstructing 128 vessels, and we ended up with a single fine stray of sherds that we couldn't um, assign to a, to a vessel. So it was comprehensive in the same way with the animal bone and the architecture in terms of our reconstruction. So from that, we were able to create sort of inventories of vessels belonging to, to individual buildings. So here I put up structure one and structure four, and these are buildings that are side by side. And you can see that there are some vessels that occur in, in both structures, but the proportion or the range is different between the two structures. So there's a real here, sense here of, of, of what stuff was in, was in individual buildings. 
So that was the animal bone and pottery. I'm going to move on now to the metalwork. Now, the metalwork assemblage was, was dominated by socketed axes, and the, the curvature of the blades we were able to match to stop marks on the, on the timbers of, of the building. So we know that these axes were used in the construction of, of structure one and, and all the other roundhouses and the palisades. So all those wood chips were made using these axes. But equally, as well as finding the axe blades, we also found the axe halves as well. This one apparently being deposited before the complication as, it, as it's not charred. And this one being deposited after the complication, you can see the, the, the charring of the, the half itself. So socketed axes, um, sickles, razors, hafted spears. Again, this sense of, of the full range of later Bronze Age or Ewart Park metalwork present within the, the footprint of the of our occupation site. And again, just like with the pots, we were able to, by their location, look at the inventories of individual structures. So this time I put up structure one and structure two, but you can see that there are comparisons. So presence of sickles and gouges and chisels and razors seems to be a sort of common pattern between buildings, even if structure one has a, a lot more of the axes than, than structure two and also the presence of, of spears. So um, some of the more sort of exotic sort of material culture present in the buildings included uh, necklaces made up of a composite of, see here we've got an amber bead, there's a, a stone bead, a jet bead there, and then these things that look like dissolving sugar cubes are, are glass beads. And there's actually a, a sort of cluster here, there's, a, there's one just there as well, another one there. Um, and this was found in structure one, um, and appears to make up a, a single necklace. See the charring on the side of the amber bead. It's one of the glass beads in close up. And Alison Sheridan and, and Julian Henderson have done an analysis of the, the glass and non glass beads and the, and the sort of composition of the, the necklaces themselves. And there's a basically there's a, a real nice link here. So the, the chemistry of the glass seems to be coming from Eastern Mediterranean, almost certainly somewhere like Iran or Turkey. Um, but also we've got parts of the composite necklaces coming from Scandinavia in terms of the amber and also from, from sort of Central Europe. So I, I suppose there, there are lots of things present within the structures and there's an abundance there that we're not familiar with, but there are objects that we are familiar with in terms of what we might find on a sort of terrestrial site that's sort of robust, robust inorganic materials, so things like spindle wells and moon weights were also present, um, and they were accompanied by the exceptional in the sense that we also found the charred remnants of, the, of textiles, of fibres and fabrics associated with those objects. So this is inside structure one, and you can see all these sort of charred black masses, and in close-up, they look like this. So we've got a, there's a ball of woven fabric here, there's a plant fibre bundle here, another one there, and another one there. So, and also as well as fragments of, of finely woven textiles. And these are examples from Susanna Harris and Margarita Gleaver's analysis. And you can, the scale on here is a millimetre, so you can see how finely woven they are. And what Susanna says about the textiles from the site is that they are as good as anything found on the continent. These guys are achieving or aspiring to making the best textiles. They're all plant fibres, so they're, they're made from lime bast um, and, and from flax. Um, we don't have any uh, protein fibres, but that might be because of the preservation environment. So our sediment is alkaline rich, so it's good at preserving plant fibres, but it's not very good at preserving things like wool. So that might have been present, but we don't see it. So as well as finely woven sort of tabby weaves, there's also open twining, um, sometimes with pile, and then also fragments of fishing nets, which we also found alongside some, what we think of fishing weights. Um, but perhaps most spectacularly was that there were 30 of these plant fiber bundles all found in sort of caches together. Um, so, this understanding that we're seeing the full range of production of, of textiles right through from basically the um, 
making of the plant fibers right through to the, the making of the, of the textiles. And that was also confirmed by the presence of lots and lots of bobbins with um, yarn uh, wound around them. You can see here, this is a little ball of yarn preserved by being carbonized. Give you a sense of its scale, but also of its, of its preservation. So what Susanna said about the, the Must Farm fiber and fabrics was that it, it provides an unparalleled artifactual and spatial evidence of production, storage, and use of plant fiber products in the late Bronze Age household setting. And in a way, what she's saying about the textiles, we can also say about the other materials that I presented, it, it's, it's comprehensive and, and complete. And there is a sense here that all, all is, is, is being presented to us within, within this. So I suppose that goes back to that sort of Pompeii premise again about what it is we're actually seeing and, and what's being represented within our excavation. So to go back to structure one, um, Rather than putting ourselves in there with an armchair and a hoover, we can occupy it with the materials of the people that once lived in, lived in this roundhouse. So if I go through some of the materials, I locate where the loom weights were found and the weft twining and the plant fibre bundles in the group down here and the bobbins with the yarn on it. You can see they're all sitting in this sort of southeastern quarter of, of the building. Whereas if we locate the pots that were complete at the point of the collapse of the structure, you can see that they're more in the sort of northeastern quarter. So they're sort of complementary in their, in their distribution. And then if we locate the, the position of, of a shattered quern, you can see it has its own space within the building. And then the metalwork sort of sits so that we've got little sort of caches of razors and gouges and axes down here, and then the sickles. And then in turn, the wooden objects. So we've got these troughs and wooden buckets sitting up in this quarter. And then caches of seed and of things like emma and barley and, and flax seeds and things. In a sense that they're making sort of porridge and, and bread within, within the same location. And as this image builds, I think what's important about it is not any one distribution, but the fact that there's a sort of right handedness about the the business of the building, but also how the centre of the building is, is relatively free. So we've got that sense of everything on one side of the building. And then in turn, if we add to that the location of the beads, we have a, a necklace just over here. There's another little group of beads here, but also you can see a sort of odd one, sort of, you can imagine them springing across the structure as it collapses. And then if we locate the lamb that was found within structure one, you see it sits on the opposite side of where all the sort of activity zones are and things, and the carbonized droppings were, were found in the same location. And this, I feel like in a, in a sense, is the first time that we've ever been inside a, a Bronze Age roundhouse in, in the UK and actually seen a, an authentic distribution of, of what was going on within that space. And we can do the same with structure two, and you can see two looks a bit like one, even down to the land droppings and the location or the relative location of the, the metalwork and the pots and the wooden containers. And on here, we've got spindle whorls instead of moon waves. The structure four of the rectangular building has a similar distribution, but in other ways it's different. There appears to be a, a bucket full of broken metalwork, a sort of proto hoard, but also there appears to be pots almost as if they're, they're being stored rather than being used. And then structure five is what I'm working on currently, sort of pulling together its distribution. Again, you get that sense of that sort of right hand sidedness of the, of the distribution materials. And again, things like the rays and the sickle and the chisel and the gouge being the sort of constants between, between buildings. And if you put them together as a, as a group, so three roundhouses and a rectangular structure within, within the confines of the palisade, you can see that that, that patterning is, is very, very pervasive or, or impressive in its consistency or coherency. And then we can start thinking about how those spaces are being used, but also about the, the interrelationship between buildings and the possibility that we're actually seeing individual households um, within, within the settlement plan. And then going back to the broader plan and things, you can see here that we've got the, the sort of true distribution. So this is structure one. 
this is the pottery and the the um the quern again structured two and four but also on here i've put these sort of formative middens and you can see how they're also adding to that whole sort of understanding of the, the settlement plan itself so i'm going to finish off really with the abandonment and in a way i've already done that and i suppose this is that that idea that the abandonment of the settlement was was unplanned it, it occurred um, whilst the settlement was still in full flow, well, basically all the material culture was still was still in use. Um, and in a sense, we can think about what we normally find within a sort of terrestrial context. So we think about any settlement that we excavate that has a construction and occupation and an abandonment. And normally in terms of the amount of material culture that we'd expect to find within that, that footprint, at the point of abandonment, if it's being planned, is that all the things that are still usable, the whole pots, the metal work, the textiles, the beads, the, the living lambs and things are taken away. So we, we just don't see those sorts of quantities where within our settlement, the, the inverse happens. This is where we get the, the abundance of material culture. And this is the, the sort of, the whole sort of Pompeii connection, I suppose, in terms of our, of our, of our settlement site. So, I hope what I've presented to you really is a sort of comprehensive view of the best preserved Lake Bronze Age settlement um, and the idea that it is, a, we are able to articulate it in, in ways that we never imagined really in terms of the relationship of, of its sort of material sets. And the fact that it, it feels both cliched and the idea that we have a roundhouse with, with all the things that we sort of dreamt of that they would have within them, but in actual fact, it's it's real as in this isn't us inventing or, or imagining but this is this is how it's found so i'll finish off by saying that the, the balance of deposition in terms of the sort of settlement was the final episode in its history and this should be seen as a manifestation of the abbreviated duration of the settlement a longer time span of sustained habitation would surely have seen the balance of materials switch in favour of occupation. So I think if there was more time, there would have been more refuse, the middens would have been more developed, and we would have had a sort of a sense there of, of that sort of attrition of materials. And I think this scenario so also supports the probability that the settlement was active right up into the moment of the conflagration. So in effect, what we're seeing is that that settlement caught fire and people ran for their lives and there wasn't time to pick things up and take them with them. And the condensed or closed context character of the whole assemblage represents its most important attribute as it means we can be confident that it is co-terminous with the settlement temporarily and spatially. And it's this quality above all others that makes the material assemblage exceptional. So it's it's the brevity of the settlement, the nature or the circumstance of, of, of its end, that means that everything is, is, is connected. We're not looking at residuality, we're not looking at intrusive materials, that these things are of the same time and space. And principally, the assemblage represents an all-inclusive and therefore authentic material inventory of occupation at the settlement from its very beginning to its very end. And my last slide really, I suppose, is, is that sense that we excavated this little portion of the channel just here because that's where the quarry pit was. Um, not because we had some, I don't know, insight to where to find this settlement and things. And it, it is our belief that we're the first people to explore the channel at any sort of scale and depth. And look what we find. So it's our belief that this channel is is full of equivalent preserved settlements and, and, and busyness. Um, and it's what makes Must Farm exceptional, not just the fact of its preservation, but it's its implication, I think, that's important. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mark. Just waiting for our host, Jeff, to unmute himself. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Um, 
I've been to a number of your lectures and they improve all the time as the information comes in. And now we're at a point where we can really see a living settlement. Um, I don't know how many of the viewers have seen roundhouses in use today in Africa um, with their differential living spaces. Um, but it strikes me as, as anthropologically extremely interesting that one is seeing exactly the same continuum of the use of space. I'm sure there are a whole host of questions. I can see them coming in down below. So perhaps um, if we all thank, first of all, thank Mark for an absolutely superb presentation. Uh, the evidence is, is, is just overwhelming. So I'd like everyone to give him a, a clap, even if he, can't hear us all at the moment. And now perhaps, David, you'd like to moderate the questions. I see them coming in in the chat. And Mark, perhaps you'll do your best to answer them. Thank you. Right, if I try to address these in some sort of logical order. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of the, the construction, um, why do you think it was built over water? Was it the case that there, um, there wasn't enough dry earth to actually build on? And what implications would having it built over water have for, for how it was used? Things like managing cooking fires within the building on, on sprung floors. Good questions. First one, um, why did they build on water? I think there are lots of answers to that question, and I think one, one you could come up with straight away is that the waterways were the highways. They were the, the conduits to the, to the outside world. They were the, if, if you wanted to live at the centre of things, then you needed to be either by or on the river. I think the, the, the log boats are also a, a test to that as well. I think also in a landscape that isn't full of mountains and hills, if you wanted to build a, an enclosure that was defendable or, or, or something that you could, you could separate yourself from people, get, have a view of their approaching and things, it's, it's almost like an equivalent to that. It's like a, a marsh fort instead of a hill fort or something of that kind. It's a, it's a way of, of creating a, a, a moat or a space between you and the, the rest of the world. I think that's another reason. And I, and I, I think there's a, there's a sense also that this is a landscape that is in basically is constantly being inundated, is being saturated. It, it's the space available is, is inexorably disappearing beneath heat. And therefore land is becoming less and less available and things. And I think there's a innovation here about occupying what was once terrestrial land is now underwater. I think it's about hanging on to space as well. And then to answer the question about the hearts, that's a, it's a really good question. And it's one of the things that we've struggled to, to answer because we did not find, you know, for all of its exceptional preservation, we did not find hearts in, in, in any way that we expected to. There weren't huge slabs of clay that were burnt or stones or things like that. And our, our best understanding is that the hearts were, were perhaps um, supported within the structures, within some sort of clay construction, because each of the buildings had these big clay sort of plugs that have collapsed into, the, into the, the base of the channel. And it's possible that there were sort of clay lined ovens or something like that within, within the superstructure, and that their fragmentation means that we can't see them, but they're, they're definitely sort of fragments of something along those lines. I, hope that, I think that answers the question. I think it, it probably gets as close as we can get anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in terms of what you did find in there with, with the abundance of artefacts that survived on this occasion, how does that fit um, their, their distribution around the roundhouses with the sort of established models, um, the sort of sunwise theories and so on? About yeah, I, it's funny, isn't it? Because the other thing that's not so apparent about our structures is that most, most terrestrial buildings have 
have a porch and therefore you have an orientation that's sort of given. We're struggling to be certain either necessarily that there's a definite orientation of our building, even the possibility that there were multiple entrances into these structures. So it could be that they faced north, east, west and, and south, basically. Equally, because the buildings are, are side by side, even if your house was facing the rising sun, there's a building in front of you sort of thing. So there isn't that same sort of necessarily idea of light in the morning and darkness at the end of the day sort of thing. Um, the distribution of the material culture, there seems to be a right handedness about the, the structures, um, but it, it seems to contradict some of the models that have been created, this idea that you, you work on the southern side of the building and you sleep on the northern side, and our building seems to be doing the opposite of that. So there's some contradictions there, I think. But maybe that's what we'd, we'd hope there to be, that there isn't some universal model, but it is about context and things as well. I think so. so. So there wasn't any clear indication of entrances as such to the to the round houses. No, but I think I think I think the nature of living above water is that the intra and extra mural floors. The, the impression is is that you could have moved between buildings. Um, so, but what's interesting about the distribution of materials is that there also appears to be household assemblages. So it seems to mount, maintain individual structures. But there's a permeability between those buildings. And I think it, in the dryland context, there'd probably be a lot more space between individual structures as well. But obviously, if you're building on water, if you want to have space between buildings, that's a lot of floor you've got to build between that. So I think there's a sort of it's, it's sort of shrunken settlement in that sense, if that makes sense. What sort of size population do you think were living in these buildings? <laughs> A good question, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, may, maybe it comes down to the to the number of fineware bowls or something like that. May, maybe it's you know maybe it's fifty people. The problem we've got also is that we're only seeing half of our settlement, aren't we? So my, my impression is that the settlement filled the channel, and that perhaps what we saw is is a mirror image of what was once there. So maybe if we find five structures, there were ten in total. So, you know, then you start to think then about the sort of, I don't know, the, the sort of the flow of people within within that settlement. But maybe also this is one settlement of many as well. So that sort of relationship there. I think, I think in a way, rather than answering it, there were X number of people, maybe it's going to come down to the sort of sense of the balance of material culture, the number of necklaces, the number of axes, the number of fineware bowls. And, and that, that proportion will give us some sort of impression. Sure. In terms of the, the preservation conditions, it was obviously the, the waterlogged conditions that um, preserved the organic materials. But if a, a building burnt down normally on dry ground, you'd expect people to be able to go in afterwards and retrieve mm -hmm. uh, the valuable metal items and so on. Is there, yeah. is there any evidence why that wasn't possible this time? Yeah, that's a good, another good question. It's, Unplanned abandonment. Now, what does that mean? That unplanned abandonment could mean you've been attacked, you're running for your lives, you're getting out of there and you kept, you kept running and you never came back. That could be one explanation. It could be that the nature of the conflagration, the collapse of the superstructure, the burial environment of the river made it impractical to, to pull the roofs off to find the the missing objects or it might even be that the, the sheer abundance of material culture that this site seems to represent is that they weren't the things that we perhaps were seeing as being of mm. high value weren't necessarily so that may be that there was so much pottery and metalwork and and wooden objects in circulation that you went and made another one i don't know it's that sense of of Maybe that's a reflection of, of just the sheer wealth of material that's that's present within that landscape at that time. I don't, you know, it's it's that or another connotation is is the you know, the burning down the settlement was a deliberate act of of, of burial, of, of of 
sacrifice or something, and that this is some grand performance that was we stopped and and everyone stood around and watched it burn and applauded. I don't know. These are all these are all possibilities. So. I suppose one of the main problems with this site is that it's atypical in terms of preservation, but we don't know how typical it is in terms of overall Bronze Age roundhouses and, and what what we'd find if this were the normal sort of way that we find them in. Yeah, but I hope in, in my presentation there's a hint there that I'm suggesting that this is typical in the sense that there are lots of themes about the architecture and the material assemblages that do resonate with the less well-preserved settlement sites. And that because we didn't find hundreds of querns or thousands of spindle worlds and things, that the number of those would have, would appear to be proportionate to the settlement. Mm. So why do we then think that maybe the pottery isn't equally, you know, the right number sort of thing? I'm I'm I would like to think that the settlement assemblage will become the standard to which we measure other settlements from. And that, that impoverishment that you're describing from the sort of the, the less well-preserved sites is uh, is real, if that makes sense, and that we need to think about now about how we refurnish or resupply that that past in terms of the, the abundance. That's that's always one of the problems with dealing with any prehistoric site, in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in terms of the textiles, do you think that have been produced? Um, on site, and particularly the, the very finest textiles, and if yes, so, yes. How, how would people have got sufficient light into the buildings to be actual, actually able to see what they were doing? <laughs> That's or, or would, would it have been an outdoor activity? Yeah, well, it looks like it was an indoor activity because it looks like, you know, the, the loom was inside the southeastern quarter of Structure One, and I don't know. I, I, I suppose maybe you could ask the same question about medieval urban textile production and you know the the nature of it then of the sort of cottage industries or something like that maybe its proximity to a potential doorway or something was enough for them to see or maybe the the half also lit what they were doing in things i think it's um i think one of the major products of our settlement was textiles you know they they were they were growing flax to harvest, to, to manufacture, to, you know, to, to perhaps to even to exchange these, these material goods in order to get beads from Iran or, or I don't know, metalwork from southeastern, southwestern England or whatever it was. And things, so. uh, there's a question about livestock management. Um, you, you mentioned the splitting in half of animals and um, the idea of, of half remaining and half going elsewhere. Um, was this being done nearby? Were they managing livestock or, or hunting communally with other nearby settlements perhaps? Is there evidence that um, goods were being traded for meat or vice versa? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I think, I think there might be something about the... There might be something about the... The duration of the settlement. There might be something about the when it was being constructed and they were out there collecting timber to build the roundhouses and the palisade, they were killing wild boar and red deer at the same time. And as well as coming back with 300 ash poles to build the palisade, they were coming back with right hand sides of giant red deer and things like that. So that might be something about that element of the settlement. Um, but I, I like what you're saying in that question. I think the idea that there is a, there is the idea that the other side of the, of the animal went to another settlement nearby. And it tells us something about social organisation and the relationship to that, to that broader landscape. I think that's a, I think that's an important way of thinking about it. In, in terms of social organisation, um, obviously one of the other best known Bronze Age sites from the country is Flag Fen, which is just yeah. up the road. Is yeah. there any evidence of, of links with that site? No, because, see, that's, that's another interesting question, because remember, two things come from that question. One is, look how busy our landscape is. It's got a Flag Fen and a Must Farm in the same space. Look how much timber we used in the construction of these different edifices. But also you have to remember that Flag Fen, its chronology 
is 1300 to 900 BC. So it goes through centuries of use and maintenance. It then basically, no one touches it, it seems. And then, you know, 50 years, 100 years later, a must farm is constructed. It's a, you know, it's a different, it's a different, a different period in the use of, of that landscape. So, but equally, the metalwork that's to be, being deposited along Flag Fen starts in the Middle Bronze Age, that continues through into the Late Bronze Age. So there's large amounts of Europe Park metalwork associated with those timbers, as there is with our settlement. So there is an integration there as well. I just, I just think it's a, it's a testament to not just to, to preservation, but just the fact that these wetland contexts of Fenland are stuffed full of things. We, wherever we dig a hole, it seems, we find something, you know what I mean? And it, you know, we, we took a bunch of students down the Must Farm Rodden. We punched a hole into the river channel with a bucket that was 50 centimetres wide on a small mechanical excavator. We went down four metres and we pulled out a fish trap. It's literally, it's that busy. You can push in a pin and pull out a, an artefact in, in effect. And I think that that relationship to Flag Fen is, is, is telling us something about the scale of, of, of activity alongside the scale of material. I think that is the case that we've traditionally excavated on the gravel islands and found yeah. what we find and, and yeah. as soon as we go into the deeper waterlogged preservation then, then yeah. this becomes the standard. But I, but, I, but I think it's contextual in the sense that because come the Iron Age settlement appears in abundance on the dry land and the wetland context it disappears. We, we don't have an equivalent to these sites for the, for the Iron Age. So there's an oscillation there between these these environments and where people want to live. So whatever that dynamic is, the later Bronze Age seems to, seems to be about I want to live on water. The earlier Iron Age seems to be I want to live on land. And you know these are these are big changes or transformation about in settlement patterns. Mm. The pots that you found in in the houses. Would they be manufactured locally or were they traded in from elsewhere? So, um, Patrick Quinn looked at the petrology, looked at the, the fabrics to the pots, um, and he's suggesting that there's nothing in there to say that they were from far away. He thinks they're all local materials. So they're, they're, they're being made, if not we don't have evidence for them being made on site, but they're definitely made within, you know, the locality, the region. They're also, um, there's a, just like everything else, there's a coherency about the ceramic forms that our pottery specialist, Matt Brudenell, suggesting that there aren't many hands used in the production of this. And this may be one or two potters have made the entire assemblage. So that brevity of duration, but also the, the sort of, the fact that it all belongs to this one settlement. You can see uniformity in the rims and the sharp shoulders and things like that. And there's a sense here that, you know, there are, there are sets that were introduced to the settlement at the beginning, and there are sets that were introduced to the settlement towards the end. But it's within that time frame. There's just one last question that I can see from the moment. Is there any evidence of religious activity on site? <laughs> Or for a domestic site, would religious activity have been inextricable from day-to-day -day activities? Yeah that's, a, yeah, that's the point, isn't it? I didn't show the human remains that we, we found associated with the settlement, and there aren't very many. There's like six fine spots altogether, really. There's a skull that was found in one of the middens. There's a, a skull fragments inside structure two that were charred, uh, that, that were coal sign from the fire. There's a lumbar vertebra, there's a, a single canine tooth from a human being. There's, there's very little. I don't know, but our understanding of settlement in the later Bronze Age is that human body parts or the remains of your ancestors were incorporated into the settlement. They were part and parcel of, of your everyday life. You know, I know, Granny's skull was on the mantelpiece or something like that, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. I'm just trying to think what, what would constitute a sort of 
a religious ritual signature within our settlement record. Unless, unless we go down the line of that, that the deep, a lot of the deposition was actually structured and planned and was you know, equivalent to some of the things that we talk about within, within the terrestrial context and things. But I, I struggle with that, I think. But you know, partly because of the sort of, I feel like we've got some sort of, as, as Jeff was suggesting, we've got some sort of ethnographic sort of tableau in front of us here of, of, of everyday life, I think. So. Right. I, I think there's just one last question I can see that hasn't at least partly been covered by your answers already. You mentioned about fish nets. Was yeah. there much evidence of fish bones that you found? Yes. Yes. There's, um, so that's another reason, I suppose, for living on, on water is that there's a, there's a supply there of fish. So we know that they were, they were eating pike. There's lots of pike mandibles in the middens around the structures, forming these lovely sort of halos around the buildings and things. Um, we also know uh, from the coprolite evidence that these people were basically defecating into the river and then eating fish from the same, the same environment and then getting things like fish tapeworm and then basically becoming unwell. So, you know, it's, it's the richness if I, but if I was to describe everything that's going on within our settlement site, we'd be here for hours. So it's, you know, it's another part of that sort of rich texture, really, so. Yes, we, we appreciate that very much, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> that's come to the end of the questions on chat. Good. So I, I, think, um, I think you've exhausted the audience now. <laughs> well, can, can I say once again, thank you, Mark. It was absolutely fascinating. Good. Um, one, one in archaeology one doesn't often feel one's dealing with real people one's slightly detached whereas here you get very very close to a living community um for us in in the neem uh, neem valley archaeological trust um our patron saint is edmund tyrrell Artis, who actually was asked by the british museum to excavate a canoe in 1838. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where it came from. I think nearer towards Whittlesea. Yeah, no, no, it was it was it was upstream from where we are. It was ah, near upstream. Horsey. Yeah, at Horsey Hill. Oh, it was at Horsey. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you if you plot the log boats that have been found in, in our locality, they all fall within the Paleo Channel. As as you'd expect, I suppose. So. Yeah. Yeah. So um we, we feel deeply attached to this and thank you again thank you i hope everyone has enjoyed it and we'll meet again in nearly a month's time um and we'll start talking about where people came from thank you very much indeed thank you thank you thank, thank you, everyone. you good afternoon good afternoon <laughs>